If I was the CEO, I would be putting the initiative where it's going to have the greatest success. Uh, You want success and you want momentum in order to carry out throughout the entire organization. Eventually, the job of customer experience management is everybody's job. But where it sits at the beginning is where there's the most energy, passion, and leadership. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. What comes to mind when you think of loyalty erosion? Do you currently have a formal loyalty plan, measurement or metrics in place? Well, most SMB companies don't even understand how to take advantage of customer experience driven innovations. The customer experience is certainly an untapped area for most organizations and where bigger companies have a true edge. But how do you start on the journey of customer experience and how to ensure that your customer experience initiatives don't end up being just an idea on a napkin? In today's episode, our guest Paula Courtney shares how companies can take advantage of the customer centricity framework to improve their financial performance. She also details how to start on the journey of customer experience and enable controls to ensure that the framework gets executed and has measurable results. Finally, she describes the organizational structure for customer experience function and where it fits depending upon the stage of the company. Let me introduce Paula to you. As president of the Verde Group, Paula leads the development of new research methods for helping companies quantify the financial impact of their customer experience. The Verde Group's Canadian and U.S. retail studies have been published globally in over 35 publications, including Business Week, Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and Fortune. Paula also sits on the board of Covenant House, Canada's largest agency serving youth who are homeless, trafficked, or at risk. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Paula. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. Pleasure to be here. And I am super excited to have you because the kind of work that you are doing in the areas of customer experience, especially when we think of industries such as agriculture, I don't know how many people can think of the customer experience in those industries. So it's going to be so fascinating for our listeners. Just to kick things off, Paula, do you want to start with your personal story and current focus? Sure. Well, um, Sam, as some of your listeners may or may not know or heard of the Verde Group, but we essentially uh, are a market research consultancy and we work with many organizations across multiple verticals uh, to help them improve customer experience so that they grow their profitability. So for us, and my passion is always around connecting the customer experience with revenue growth. I think that companies need to not just Uh, you know, put bigger smiles on their customers' faces, which tends to be the case when people talk about customer experience or improving customer satisfaction. I think there has to be a mandate to connect what your customers want and expect and how you can translate that into improved profitability. Because there's there's no question there is a direct connection between your customer's experience and their willingness to continue to buy from you, buy more from you, recommend and refer your products to others. There is indeed a correlation between the customer experience and the revenue growth. 
a lot of people might not know how to fix the customer experience is issues and drive growth, but there is definitely a correlation between that. So we are going to dig into all of that. But before we do that, we have one of these standard questions that we ask every single guest. And that is going to be Paula your perspective on business growth. I have a pretty unique perspective in that um, a lot of the work that we do is focused on understanding the dark side of business. And I know that sounds bizarre, but I believe that if you understand the friction and the negative experiences that your customers have when they do business with you, you have a greater opportunity to innovate and to create solutions that not only mitigate the financial risk of those problems, but actually you can accelerate growth. If you think about why customers buy from organizations, they buy because they trust. And when you violate that trust by creating friction in that customer experience, you actually create reasons for them to not do business with you anymore. So I really believe there is a lot of money to be made by focusing on dissatisfaction and understanding the friction in any business. And it's very unpopular to do that. I think yep. there's a lot of you know, sex appeal and uh, allure to focus on understanding what surprises and delights customers, what gets them excited about your business, what you need to do to deliver wow. When at the end of the day, real money is made by understanding what you're doing that creates friction, that makes them dissatisfied. Because if you can fix that, then you have earned the right to create delight and surprise. Okay, so amazing commentary there. And obviously, you know, these things are, uh, you know, very easy to talk about. A lot of people sort of understand what this means and and how this is going to impact their businesses. But it's very, very, very hard to, number one, identify these issues and number two, fix them. And the best way to understand how you have fixed these issues or able to relate with the business is going to be in the form of story. And as we were talking in the pre-show that you had a story of a customer, they had the customer experience issues. So I don't even know where to start when it comes to the customer experience journey or solving these customer experience issues. So do you want to talk about this business a little bit? Describe their business model, describe their customer channels, the kind of customer channels that they have. And the core issue that they had, let's say when they contacted you for the customer experience, or I don't know if there was something else that actually turned into the customer experience opportunity. So do you want to talk about the business model? Do you want to talk about customer channels and the core issue that they had? Absolutely. So I will tell the story of this one organization, uh, which was an agriculture manufacturer. Now, what I should also say is that the majority of clients come to the Verde Group to solve fundamental business problem of customer retention, either customer shrinking, customer loyalty, or they are losing business. So, or another reason is they're perhaps... um, perceiving a incredible threat to their competitive position and that there are competitors that are, you know, eating share and, you know, they're worried. Needless to say, um, they want to mitigate that shrinkage and they want to stop the loss that they might be experiencing. In this particular case, for this manufacturer, they're a global large manufacturer who worked with their North American uh, division and they were experiencing Uh, a shrinking loyalty advantage over their primary competitor. So one of the things that we did in order to understand and reverse this loyalty erosion, we really needed to ask three fundamental questions of their business. How much loyalty erosion were they experiencing, number one? What was the impact on future spend and share allocation for their customers? who are farmers, by the way. So farmers will buy seed and they will plant that seed in order to grow corn. So the company is a seed manufacturer and the customer is a farmer. That is the end customer. So it's a B2B organization. And this manufacturer sells through a network of dealers, independent dealers. They don't own the dealer network, but they sell through dealers and farmers buy their seed through these dealers. So what we really needed to understand is what was really driving, what customer experience issues were driving this loyalty erosion. 
So we did what we call a revenue at risk assessment. And that is, we did an inventory, we surveyed their customers, their farmers, we actually surveyed their dealers as well, to understand their pain points, to understand okay. what what negative experiences were actually occurring. And we did this with their competition as well. We actually surveyed their competitor customers to understand how this particular organization compared from a friction perspective. Yep. So is this company doing better or worse? Are there a different set of customer issues? And what we found is that there was no question that this organization was underperforming the competition in a few areas. Number one is they didn't recognize and reward their customers for their business. So there were relationship equity challenges with this particular company. And number two, the farmer who purchases seed has to rely on that manufacturer to produce data to basically support that the seed is going to produce specific yields for their farms, right? Yep. Farms make money when, uh, you know, a crop or a an acre of their crop can produce the maximum number of bushels of whatever crop they're growing. Yeah. So seed manufacturers will make claims that, hey, this seed, this hybrid is going to produce maximum bushels uh, per acre. So they're going to make more money. Yeah. So what one of the biggest problems for this particular organization was that the farmers were suspicious of the data that this company used to support their yield claims. Okay. So there was a lack of trust in the data. And when there was no trust, those farmers were buying from other manufacturers. So those were the two predominant issues that were disproportionately different from the competitive set, from the, their number one competitor. And in this particular industry, there are two giant players. So 1.1 of a share can absolutely reflect, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in actual revenue. So movement and share erosion are critical metrics that this company was really, um, you know, interested in protecting and measuring and understanding. So we we did this massive study, and what we found is that, and this is true for some of your listeners, that getting and collecting great customer insights and great data is one small part of the story to truly realizing the economic benefit of fixing customer issues. Executing on insights is the single most important thing that an organization can do. In fact, I would say that sometimes it's okay to have subpar data, yeah. but be phenomenal at executing. That is more important than having amazing data, very accurate, but being really poor at executing on those insights. And this organization, let's just say they didn't have a track record for executing uh, well against customer insights. So we worked with the entire executive team. We built a governance structure. We built a, a cross-functional team of what we called customer experience champions to really locally improve customer issues at the ground level. What we fundamentally trained this organization to do is to solve customer issues. And I think that that, at the end of the day, Sam, is so critical to true transformation. If you want to build a customer-centric organization that's rallied around the customer, that uses insights to drive decision-making, that is focused on profitable growth through innovation based on customer insights, you absolutely need to think about changing the culture of your organization. Train every level in the organization to recognize the importance of customer insights and to be nimble and responsive to issues when they occur at the local level, not just in the ivory tower where executives are saying, oh, my God, we need to focus on customers because they really matter, yeah. but really driving that to the front lines. And that's really what we did. And it was a three year journey. But in the end, the, the you know, the business case was proof. The company 
absolutely was able to prove that when customer issues were solved to a customer's complete satisfaction, there was a 15 percentage gain in the reorder, in the uh, sales orders compared to a control group. So we were able to pilot successfully this, you know, a, a few interventions using this top down, bottom up uh, cultural transformation that we really needed to get a part of. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. So there are obviously very, very many layers to this conversation, and I would like to dig into all of them one at a time. So one of the things that I am going to start with is going to be when we look at the seed business, obviously, it's going to be a very commoditized business. But at the same time, you have a lot of variables. For example, let's say if you have the, the seed manufacturer who is supplying to these farmers, they are making tons of claims that, you know what, if you buy my seed, then obviously you are going to get this crop. But when you actually look at the the business of agriculture, there are a lot of different variables. It could be soil conditions, it could be weather, it could be environment, and there are a lot of things that could go wrong in meeting those expectations. So when you work with this opportunity, so I know that, you know what, you mentioned that, you know what, you need to have the data, you need to have the execution plan. So some of the things can be solved by having the communication that, you know what, um, you know, I am providing you these variables. If you apply all of these, then you are going to get this kind of growth. If you don't do this, then that's on you. That's not on us. So you have the clear communication or you can improvise the targeting. So when you work on this engagement, what were the core underlying reasons why there was, again, did you work on the communication model or did you improvise the targeting that the dealers that were not really getting the the yield that they would hope but it was primarily their mistake so did you improve the targeting or did you primarily improve the communication both so number one you're absolutely right that there are in agriculture there's so many variables that are outside of a manufacturer and even a farmer's control whether yeah. being one uh, you know, drought can have a massive negative impact on a crop. Yep. Uh, infestation uh, disease uh, also has a massive impact on the performance of a particular crop. So the key that we found was the transparency and communications between the seed manufacturer, the dealer, because the dealer is for all intents and purposes, the front line to that farmer. So we worked very closely with with them to ensure greater transparency in the communication on things that can go awry. But most farmers are acutely aware of how weather can negatively impact. And typically they don't put that on the manufacturer to be responsible for a drought or an infestation, which can occur because there's so many inputs into a farm. There's fertilizer, there's crop protection, right? So nutrients, there's, you know, and there's equipment. I mean, everything there's, the seed is one of the tiniest inputs into a farm. So we worked on that for sure, but we also worked with the um, with the organization to improve agronomic support. I think that was a critical uh, success criteria because what we found is that for the high value growers, providing very dedicated agronomic support actually improved their perception that they were valued customers. And since they suffered from lack of reward and recognition as an attribute, the agronomic support actually did serve two objectives. One is it improved uh, the perception that customers were valued. And number two, it gave them dedicated agronomic support to help manage um, you know, yield performance and yield outcomes to maximize what they can expect on a farm. So it was actually very beneficial. But to do those two things, which seemed quite simple, yeah. it took... It took a it took a village, right? It took the entire organization. It took customer facing functions to truly buy into the importance of um, of these attributes. And and we really needed what we call data to prove. You know, show me the data. We needed to prove to the to the staff that this data really did make a difference. And and that that proof point was critical to getting alignment and buy-in from the organization on uh, on the importance of this initiative. Okay. So the next layer that I am going to touch is going to be 
the the competitive layer and you mentioned that you know what they were going to the competitor because they felt that they were getting better yield with the competitor now i don't know if this was purely the perception or there was a real uh, difference in the yield and typically you know it's very 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 hard to meet the expectations if there is going to be a real uh, product difference right so in this particular case why were they going to the competitor was there a real difference between the product the uh, you know product that competitor was trying to sell or was this primarily the messaging uh, because of which they felt that you know what they should be going to competitor as opposed to working with this uh, this seed supplier there were a number of issues that differentiated this particular manufacturer from their competitor number 1 is their service model was very different. Okay. In the competitive market, they had dedicated dealers. So they owned the dealer network. So huge advantage versus the our client who didn't own the dealer network. The dealer network was third party. They were independent. So that's a massive market advantage. The second was the competitor just had, they didn't have superior products, but they were at parity. So when you have an advantage in your service model and you have parity in your product, you immediately have a market advantage. So what this organization needed to do, it either needed to create a better story around their data and their premium products, right? Why they were superior. And two, they needed a better collaborative relationship with their independent dealers in order to serve the farmer. So uh, that's, I mean, it, it was very, very um, challenging, but it's it, it worked. It absolutely improved the share position of our client, but it took, it took about three years. So it wasn't silver bullet and it wasn't overnight, but it was a transformation of massive proportions where you really needed to involve every function in the organization from supply chain to agronomy to uh, manufacturing to pricing to marketing they were all involved and we worked with the senior leadership team and building this network of champions within the organization sort of infiltrating every department and getting continuous customer insights absolutely helped to drive those improvements Okay, very interesting. So just to be clear, uh, did they end up owning the dealer network or did they not no. own the dealer network? Okay, so primarily the messaging, the communication is what improved. Uh, but as such, from the product perspective, from the distribution perspective, everything else remained the same, right? It's very difficult to change your market strategy from a dealer perspective. So in this case, they they simply improved that that relationship they had with their dealers and working more collaboratively with their dealers to improve outcomes for growers. So that was how they had to do it in order to face off their competitor who owns their dealer network. Okay, so when we look at data, obviously data could be all over the place. And you did mention that, you know what, initially uh, they did not really trust the data. And that was the primary reason why they didn't want to work with this particular supplier. And they wanted to actually go to the competitor. So when you looked at the data, and I don't know if this was some sort of, you know, centralized system that was used to communicate the insight or the gather the insight that you were looking for. So I know this is a very large global customer. Did you have to utilize multiple systems to be able to gather this data? Did you have to construct any sort of analytical system to be able to find the data that you wanted to communicate to the customer? So talk about a little bit of what was the system landscape like and what was the analytics capabilities were before the engagement and after the engagement? So the client at the time was beginning to invest in what's called precision farming, okay. which, is, which is basically uh, using technology, drone technology, and uh, farm equipment technology okay. to absolutely pick up lots of information about a farm. Uh, like a square inch of land, they can identify the nutrient levels, the moisture levels, yeah. and prescribe which particular hybrid of seed is best suited for that one inch of, of farmland. Like it, yeah. it's literally that precise. And then the equipment 
uh, can actually plot multiple hybrids of seed on a single plot of farmland. So that kind of technology was already in play when we began our work and it, it just accelerated from there. So what the client did was they worked with their farmers to create plot trials. So they okay. would create a plot of land and they would run a trial so that the farmer could see firsthand the real difference in the uh, yield uh, outcomes by running these plots, running these trials on their actual farm. So I think that was the best way to create better transparency and to remove the bias sales data on their hybrids by running trials and by encouraging farmers to opt into this precision trials and precision farming software. Okay, so when you worked on this technology, did these uh, farmers have the access to the technology by themselves or did they rely on the supplier to be able to provide the technology? Obviously, Excellent if they provide question. the technology, that's going to be a big competitive advantage, right? The good news is that most farmers already have the equipment. They have the plows. They already exist, right? The John Deere big yeah, yeah. tractor trailers that, right, they already had the plows and the technology was simply a little device that sits in the plow and actually picks up. So the technology was sort of a no-brainer. It's really the software and the analytics that go behind it. And what our client did is they actually offered free, uh, you know, you didn't have to pay anything yeah. because the advantage was for the for the manufacturer to get that data and analyze the, the farm data and then more precisely prescribe the right hybrid for that farm. So it was totally a win-win. The farmer wins by getting maximum yield outcomes and the manufacturer wins by selling more seed and that's custom grown or custom uh, designed for that particular, uh, for that particular farmer. So and is- they would have access to data, uh, right? Because you know, every time a plow is on the field, it's collecting and feeding back to the manufacturer all the data about the particular crop. And with that data, then the manufacturer is able to invest more in R&D and create better hybrids, better yeah. species to uh, maximize um, output. output. Yeah, so this is a very interesting scenario of augmenting the product bundle because here you are offering more of the solution as opposed to just the commoditized product, which in this case is probably going to be seeds. So in this particular case, since you augmented the product offering, did competitors actually pick on this? Did they provide similar capabilities? Was it not possible for them? Do you have any any insight yeah. into competitors? We don't, but I can tell you that innovation has a very short shelf life. Yeah. And if one manufacturer is large enough to invest in that technology, a lot of them are. And a lot of dealers invest in that technology as well. Yeah. So it's not it's not specific to our client. Yeah. In this instance, you have a first to market mover advantage and yeah. you also have an advantage over which technology is superior at driving data that produces outcomes. So the competitive set is now that it's not who's got this technology. It's 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 like saying who's got a laptop. Well, everyone does, but which one is better, right? So yeah, very interesting. So let's go back to the governance uh, framework comment that you had made. So when we look at the data and analytics, so in this particular case, I don't know if this was more of the centralized warehouse that you had to uh, sort of keep this data into that to be able to get the insight that you are looking for for the customer? Or is it going to be up to the, let's say, the sales rep or the sales engineer who is going to go in the field? They are simply going to get the data from the device. Um, They are going to analyze and they are going to simply tell the customer the story, the way it should be told. So in this particular case, was it more of the, the personal engagement of the sales rep or did you have to sort of create the centralized warehouse where you have the centralized insight and then you had to get for each of the, the, the customer when they work on the deals? So it's a little bit of both. Okay. So now Verde Group's work, our work, we're not helping them with that particular element of the engagement. We're okay. simply identifying the customer insight that is driving some of these innovations that they are doing. But yeah. We're not really involved in the analytics regarding crop data and how that 
data is then used to produce, you know, uh, recommendations or what what they call scripts yeah. uh, for farms. Um, but I would say that from my understanding of how it worked, it was done through a centralized database which then was analyzed by a team and then fed to sales reps who would then meet with farmers, meet with dealers to help them uh, with that particular farm. And this is particularly for large farms, uh, more than a thousand acres of land, yeah. not for the small holder who has maybe a much smaller farm where it's just not worth it to have different hybrids on you know, 50 acres. Yeah, very interesting. So let's talk about the governance framework that you had mentioned that, you know, uh, you had to build the governance framework and it took roughly three years for you to to be able to execute on this engagement. So I don't know if you are going to have any sort of phases that you have had developed as part of this engagement when you started. And what was the governance framework like? You know, how many different stakeholders were there and why the governance framework was required for this engagement? It's an excellent question. And I would say that it didn't take three years to develop the governance framework. It took three years for the organization to realize the financial outcomes of all of their initiatives based on our initial data. The governance framework was in place within six months of us engaging with this client. And it was a three-tiered governance structure. So we had an executive steering committee. Okay. We had a customer experience council, okay. and then we had a network of customer experience champions. Okay. So the executive steering committee, they were the ones who basically made the decisions on where we're going to invest. What are the big ticket items that we're going to back financially? So it's that leadership group that basically releases the funds yeah. for those initiatives. The steering, the the, uh, the council, the customer experience council, which is a group of co- cross-functional managers, they're the ones who act as leaders to the champions. They're the ones who lead the various initiatives, remove obstacles, uh, remove roadblocks, ensure funding is in place because it's been secured by the executive leadership team, and they ensure that the progress is on, you know, that the project or the initiative is running on track. And then the champions are the ones who are the doers. They're the ones who are actually doing the work, working with small teams uh, to execute and make the changes, presenting them to the steering committee, the yeah. uh, sorry, the, the council. And then the council, if they need more funding, they would go to the executive um, leadership team. So it was a three-tiered you know, governance model, which worked quite effectively, it's still in place. And I think uh, eight years in the running. So it, it's it, it's very successful. And eventually it became part of the com- company's culture and com- part of the company's DNA, yeah. the way they were structured. So, and the other thing that was really critical is consistent corporate communications. So okay. communicating victories to the entire organization when we had a customer success story. Uh, when we had a major uh, victory of of sorts, either you know a sales victory because we solved the customer's issue and they ordered more on their next for the next order season, which is an annual season yeah. for North America. So it it you know communications was a critical element. Uh, it was kind of the glue that ensure this governance structure was effective. Okay, very interesting. So let's talk about the the organizational structure. And, you know, when we look at different companies, this particular company was obviously large. They had a large budget to be able to support such initiative. I don't know if the similar governance structure is going to be applicable even for the smaller manufacturers who might be looking for Similar initiatives, they might not have as big team, but they might have aspirations to be able to do this. So from the organization perspective, number one, is this going to be just one time deal? And then you can probably shrink down the team. I don't know how the the governance structure is going to be on an ongoing basis. Is it like, you know, you big a large team and once the project is done, then you are probably going to shrink down? Or is it always going to be, okay, um, you have this three layered structure and you are always going to continue with that? So it really depends on the evolution of that company, where they are on their customer centricity journey. Okay. Are they neophytes? Are they mature? So if you think about a maturity curve and yeah. where they are, where they're at in their journey, 
you need more governance in the beginning at the early stages of that journey. And then the governance can sort of uh, start to be infiltrated with the, the traditional work structure of that organization where it's in, it's embedded in the DNA, it's embedded in current work structure. So, so you, I would say if you're at the beginning of that journey, you want to formulate a formal separate governance around customer experience. And as you mature and as you start to get better training and better skilled at using customer insights to drive initiatives, to drive strategy, yeah. then it, it changes. It absolutely does. So so today in my client's organization, it's a version of what we had at the beginning, but it's not exactly the same. It might have three levels, but those levels are loosely fitting within their current org structure, which is a tiered one. So, so I think the answer is it depends. And yes, set up a formal structure, no matter what size of company you are, to really kickstart your initiatives. Okay, so let's attack this from a, a slightly different perspective. So when we do anything slightly different, let's say if you are talking about sales, marketing, operations, finance, accounting, what this is all a standard, everybody sort of knows where they fit in the organization. Now, when you talk about slightly newer teams, newer initiatives, obviously you need to know what is going to be the reporting structure, where they are going to fit, and obviously you need the accountability as well. Whether the, the money that you are pouring in, in your customer initiatives, customer experience initiatives, that's really working well. Now, when we look at the customer experience initiatives, pretty much everybody in the organization sort of talks about the customer experience issues. Whether you talk about technology, sales, marketing, everybody's sort of talking about that. Now, if they all try to work on these initiatives, there's going to be a significant overlap. So from the organization perspective, where does it fit? Does uh, customer experience report to, let's say, marketing? Does it report to sales? Is it going to be a separate organization that reports to the CEO? How is the organization structure that you typically see uh, among your client base? Fantastic question. And I would say that one size does not fit all. We see it all over the map. Okay. We see it sometimes tucked underneath marketing. We okay. see it tucked under operations and we see it tucked under sales. And we see it also tucked as a separate organization reporting to the CEO. I can tell you this, wherever there is the passionate leader to drive change management, that's where it should belong to get kickstarted. So if you have a very strong customer focused forward thinking leader in your operations department, then it should fit with there. If I was the CEO, I would be putting the initiative where it's going to have the greatest success. Uh, you want success and you want momentum in order to carry out throughout the entire organization. Eventually, the job of customer experience management is everybody's job. But where it sits at the beginning is where there's the most energy, passion, and leadership that might already be organically in place. And if there isn't, if you've got a CEO who basically says, I don't have a leader who can do this, then they might have to go outside and start a function that reports directly to that CEO uh, in order to kickstart it. I've seen all of those situations and they all happen and they all uh, work very successfully. But the one thing they all have in common is where the greatest energy and passion exists in the leadership team. And that's where it should sit. Yeah, could not agree more. I think that's where the the place needs to be. You need to follow the energy, the passion, and that's where you are going to get the highest ROI. So let's go back to the the phases that you had, um, you know, for this engagement. And obviously, three year is a rather long, uh, you know, engagement. Any executive or the leader out there, if they are committing for three year engagement, they are going to sweat a little bit, right? So when you were actually building the phases, what was the the process like? Did you sort of add um, you know, have some sort of POC in the beginning, and then uh, you implemented that idea at the ROI. Went on to implement some more. How did the the uh, how did you structure the phases? Yes, uh, great question as well. So, in this particular case, and what is typical for us is we always begin with a twelve week engagement, which okay. is a baseline revenue at risk study. And that baseline study essentially, you know, assesses the overall customer experience and quantifies where the greatest financial risk is for the organization. 
It ends with an action planning session where we take a cross-functional leadership team in a room and we ideate around the initiatives necessary in order to close the gap and in order to monetize uh, on the customer experience. So that typically is that 12-week engagement. But once the engagement um, is complete, there's the need to track how well you're doing against your initiatives. So we always encourage organizations to immediately keep their pulse on their customer, uh, even if they say, well, wait a second, we just we're just starting to implement these things. Customers won't notice a change yet. But the point is you want to train the organization to listen to customer feedback on a continuous basis. It's kind of like saying, you know what? I won't collect sales data on a daily basis because my, you know, I'm not selling very much. So you stop collecting data. You, you're constantly collecting sales data, operations data. So think of customer insights as the same type of data as sales and operational data and productivity data. I mean, it's critical. You collect it on a continuous basis and it forms part of your overall assessment of how healthy your organization is. So you need multiple metrics to run a business successfully and a customer experience metrics are part of that, part of that uh, balanced scorecard, if you will. And so the second phase of uh, a Verity Group engagement is in helping them build a continuous monitoring system, a continuous tracking of their voice of customer. So that's typically the second phase. And then the third phase might be implementing a closed loop system where, you know, we're now implementing technology and dashboard that basically ties into Salesforce or ties into any other CRM system that helps link not only the voice of the customer, but also all of those operational metrics and even social media, like what, what's being said on social and how do we connect the voice of the customer that is outside of a survey? You know, how do we get and formulate an entire picture of what's happening with our customers and our business uh, in automated way? And that's really the direction of where CX is moving is we need to understand what's happening with our customer without actually sending them a survey. Yeah. So since you talk a lot about the economic value and when you look at things like monitoring social media signals, obviously uh, it's going to require a lot of effort to be able to monitor and it's going to be very hard to justify the value, whether you are going to get any sort of value, tangible value out of these initiatives. So initially when you are working with these customers, how do you justify the economic value of each of the monitoring and the analytics engine that you are trying to build? Uh, and that you are trying to communicate to your customers. Yeah, and I think it really depends. The investment that they make is commensurate with the potential ROI that they will realize. So obviously, if the maximum ROI is small because they're a smaller company, then the investment is going to be smaller as well. But when we're talking about a multi-billion dollar con- you know, company that operates in 35 countries and absolutely the the win is so significant if they get it right they are willing to make the investment in coalescing all those listening po- posts and coalescing voice of customer data to to really simplify their performance to understand where the biggest hits where the biggest threats um, it's just a necessary cost of doing business i mean i, I almost think it's hard to, to run a business without that kind of data Okay, amazing. So that's it for today. Do you have any last minute closing thoughts or remarks for our listeners? I I think that the basic thing that I want to say is that, like I said before, having great customer insights is one thing, but more importantly, the ability to execute, take action is the most important trainable attribute that you can give your organization. So if you can train the company, your people, your staff, to take action, to execute against customer insights, then I'd say you're 90% there. Okay, amazing. And my personal takeaway from this conversation is going to be, obviously, there are going to be a lot of different ideas in improvising the customer experience, but what really matters is the execution. So make sure you have the real execution plan. And once you try to implement, make sure you are going to monitor as well. On that note, I really want to thank you for your time. This has been a fascinating episode, Paula. Thank you so much, Sam. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge, 
and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guest and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Paula, head over to verdegroup.com. It's V-E-R-D-E-G-R-O-U-P.com. They can help improve CX to improve your financial performance in the highly competitive manufacturing industry. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Gabriel Panescu, CEO of Now Logic, who discusses the nuances of the agriculture and poultry business and how the manufacturing processes are different from other industries. Also, the interview with Christine von Fender, who discusses the procurement process for food packaging equipment. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.